In the agonizing build-up to Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, we're going to take a look back at the second Indiana Jones movie, The Temple of Doom. Right off the bat, this is the coolest title for an Indiana Jones movie. Obviously, Dial of Destiny is the worst title by far, but if we pretend that movie doesn't exist, it would be hard for me to decide which title is the worst although Temple of Doom is the best. Unlike the first movie in the indie saga, Temple of Doom seems to be hated by a lot of people. Temple of Doom, as conceptualized by George Lucas, was intended to be a film detached from the first movie, which I like. I've said many times that you're never gonna go anywhere with your IP if you don't innovate. The second film is still recognizable as an Indiana Jones movie, as it has the same protagonist, obviously. A MacGuffin that has religious cultural significance, and other stuff that was in the first film. Temple of Doom was a very risky film to make. Some might have seen it as too different, but George Lucas likes different. As he said about Star Wars, he made sure to make every film different from each other. From what I understand, George Lucas had a fascination with Indian culture, something which I honestly don't give two shits about. Sorry people from India and surrounding regions, but it was just never to my taste. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom made it interesting in the movie's context, but from what I hear, how the movie depicts certain things wasn't received well by everyone. The two locations visited in this movie, China and India, have made the movie widely unpopular by Chinese and Indian people. For the second movie, it was a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark in the timeline, although it's not a direct prequel, because it does not continue the story from Raiders of the Lost Ark. The reason for this is because Raiders story was done and finished. The Indiana Jones franchise at this point was designed to tell standalone stories with the same protagonist. That's absolutely fine. The Indiana Jones formula was designed like that. And while indie stories may have references to other adventures, each adventure has its own end goal. Dial of Destiny though seems like it'll be too derivative off of previous films. They'll probably undo Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which will be a massive mistake. And Dial back to Raiders and Last Crusade. I imagine there will be minimal references to Temple of Doom at that rate too. Something I have to point out is that making Dial of Destiny politically correct in of itself is a mistake. Because when has Indiana Jones ever been politically correct? Every indie movie is potentially going to offend someone eventually. So by going woke, you're inevitably going to fail. Because the series identity is anything but woke. Now, we're going to have an indie film that misses the point. Anyways, you've heard me ramble enough. Let's talk about Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The movie starts in 1935 China. 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 You go over to China. At Club Obi-Wan. <laughs> He said it! He said it! We start with a musical sequence of the song Anything Goes. I like the transition from Paramount to here quite well. It's a sequence to set the tone for our starting location. A club in the city of Shanghai. The largest Chinese city. Whether that was the case in 1935 too, I have no idea. But regardless, this is where our movie starts. Just like the first indie movie, we've got a mini adventure to go into before we experience the main event. From what I understand, this prologue is heavily expanded upon in the LucasArts video game Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, but I've only played the starting levels of that game, and it's a discussion for another time. We start with a deal between Indian Chinese crime boss Lao Zhi, who hired him to recover the remains of Nurhachi. The setup to this movie was really well thought out. You can piece together an implied backstory in the first minute of dialogue alone. I commonly thought when I was a kid that the Star Wars prequels deserved their own prequel trilogy. Well now that I think about it, the same is true here. And well, there is the Emperor's Tomb. Anyways, with that being said, during the deal, Loud tricks Indy into drinking poison, and pulls out a convenient antidote to taunt him. One may question why he pulled out an antidote, but in the context of the film, it's because he wanted to sway Indy into doing what he wanted. Things, however, aren't doom and gloom yet. Indy reveals his own ally, Wu Han, who is quickly taken down without much notice from everyone else. We didn't have much time to know this character, but I still felt his death. He alludes to various adventures he had with Indy prior to this point. An enraged Indy proceeds to stab one of Lao's sons with a shish kebab. 
Anyways, the antidote is sort of used as a MacGuffin for Indy to desperately retrieve to cure himself of the poison. Chaos ensues with the gunshot and Indy's efforts to search for the antidote. I should also mention the character Willie Scott, who is Indy's girl for this specific movie. She's introduced as a dancer and singer at Lao Shi's nightclub, who soon gets caught with Indy's antics. Designed as the complete contrast to Marion Ravenwood, Willie Scott has been described as annoying. Do I agree? Kinda, but I don't think it detracts from the film. Her personality of constantly screaming and complaining is played for laughs, and it's derivative of the sort of humour Indiana Jones is known for. Perhaps I'll note certain instances of this when we come across it. Anyways, there's this creative part where Indy grabs a display sword and cuts open a large gong, and uses it to flee the nightclub with Willy. Then comes the introduction of one of my favourite characters in the series, a Chinese boy ironically named Short Round, who serves as Indy's trusty sidekick. This kid is fucking gold in every scene he's in. One of the stereotype jokes they pull is the one where Short Round is the getaway driver, because haha, ha, they let kids drive cars in China. That's what I always interpreted the joke as anyways, but on the real, Short Round is a pretty good driver. There's this exchange where Indy searches Willie's area for the antidote, and Short Round says, and I quote, Hey Dr. Joe, no time for love, we got company! And we've got this chase sequence in which Indy shoots the gangsters, and when Indy gives Willie his gun, she drops it out of the car right away, complaining only that her fingernail was cracked. It's no secret that Willie is an incompetent bitch who clearly does not want to be on this adventure. Indy secures a flight out of China and taunts Lao Zhi just as he shows up. Except it's shown visually that the plane belongs to Lao Zhi. And it's set up perfectly where you've got that uh oh reaction. Anyways, Indy dresses into his normal attire and goes to sleep on the plane. The plane travels from Shanghai to the Himalayas, in which the pilots who work for Lao check to see that Indy and friends are asleep and jump off the plane with a parachute in the hopes that Indy will stay asleep and the plane will crash without them. They jettison out the fuel and jump out. Willie is the first to wake up and realizes no one flying the plane. And upon short round warning Indy that there's no more parachutes, Indy off the top of his head instead jumps out of the plane with an inflatable raft. John Williams' score pumps the fuck on as they narrowly escape death. Now in comes Willie's complaining. As per what I said, she complains about being in this situation, but it's kind of understandable since they just jumped out of a plane and narrowly avoided death, but the dialogue spoken is actually pretty good. She's essentially listing off everything in the moment she hates, which includes Indy. Short Round has a notable presence in all following scenes too. After floating around in the river next to the Himalayas, not exactly sure what the geography is supposed to be, they end up in what do you know? India. George's interest in Indian culture comes full circle here. We get this shot of a darker skinned man walking across the side of the river, and the local man brings Indy to his village. Just like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I gotta praise the set design. I truly feel immersed in the setting, as it feels like they're truly in India, or at least, how a westerner probably visualizes India. The village treats them with the utmost kindness and respect, as the visibly malnourished people give Indian friends food. And this is where the larger quest comes in. The village elder, or whoever, asks for Indy to retrieve an item known as the Sankara Stone that was stolen by evil forces at Pankot Palace, the Thuggy Cult. The dialogue sets up some intriguing mystery as well as an ominous line where the elder tells Indian friends that it was the Hindu god Shiva that brought them here, so that they could help get the stones back, and the scene is played dead serious. So it makes you wonder since the last movie had supernatural shit in it, that it also applies to Hinduism in the Indiana Jones universe. The movie was based on George's interest in Indian culture after all, they've shown the missing spot where the stone was stolen, and now it's the classic quest to retrieve the stone. During the decision, a child who was revealed to be enslaved by the thug -E cult escaped and made it back to the village, exhausted. This kid managed to get away, although many of the children remain enslaved. There's a discussion between Short Round and Indy, and this is Indy's incentive to check out Pankot Palace. The village gives them everything they need, especially elephants for transport. And when Willie finds out they're going to Pankot Palace, she unsurprisingly complains about it. So during the trip, 
Willie gets knocked off by an elephant, and Indy decides it's here where they'll camp tonight. It's here where the chemistry between Indy and Short Round occurs. While Willie's being such a bitch, Indy and Short Round are playing a card game, and accuse each other of cheating. This kid's actor is so damn good, and feels like a kid at the same time. Short Round is depicted as a resourceful and brave kid. When Willie asks, Indy explains that he met Short Round when he was a pocket trying to rob him after the Japanese bombing of Shanghai in 1932 killed his parents. Short Round throughout this movie proves to be a useful asset to Indy, despite being so young. He earned the title of sidekick, and as the movie plays, Short Round sees Indy as his father figure. This is what makes Short Round one of my favourites in the series. I looked into the production of the film from the perspective of Short Round's actor, and he had fun on making the film, and it shows. He's also grateful for Spielberg getting him cast in The Goonies too, and it all comes across as humble. Anyways, after more hiking, they make it all the way to Pankot Palace. Approaching the palace, Indy and friends are greeted by Pankot Prime Minister Chatalol. They're all invited inside as guests, with the Prime Minister in particular recognizing Indy as the famous archaeologist that he is. It's here where we get a taste of a Western version of Indian culture. If you've seen the movie, you'll know eventually we'll have to talk about the elephant in the room, and how fitting since elephants were in this movie too. So Indy and friends get settled in the palace. On first glance, Pankot Palace seems pretty normal, and the movie gives the impression that it is. And it's also here, where we meet a British captain. No evil cult in sight here. Although Indy is adamant about questioning the Prime Minister about what the villagers said about the palace. The Prime Minister dismisses the villagers as just making shit up. Although the Prime Minister does give one of his underlings a look, that basically tells us, yeah, this guy knows too much. We also meet the Maharaja, who to the dismay of Willy, is actually just a kid. In the meanwhile, we get some effective gross out, although derivative off of Indian stereotypes. Willy and Short Round share a scene where they are prepared to eat some food at a banquet, but then the food comes out, and it's the most disgusting, unappetizing things you can think of. For example, a dead snake, which is cut open, and some baby snakes come out, which one of the hungry patrons proceeds to eat without concern. It's a, like a classic Indian dish. I've been to India. I haven't seen food like that. It's Northern Indian. Northern Indian? I believe, yeah. Yeah, Northern Indian. Now, Spielberg has stated that the joke was that they were essentially trolling Willy in short round by providing food they expected to see in India due to stereotypes and gross them out on purpose, or something like that, I'm paraphrasing. Point is, this was all meant to be a joke, and not a deathly serious depiction of India. So yeah, we get snakes inside of a bigger snake, beetles or some kind of bug, and when Willy asks for soup, it's got eyeballs in it. And to top it all off, we've got chilled monkey brains. You cannot make this shit up. Yeah, that's enough for Willy to faint from the unappealing food served. The scene in context is effective as gross out. But at the same time, I hear the complaints that it's a negative portrayal of the kind of food Indians eat. Or rather, what they don't eat. Although the filmmakers have clarified it was meant to be a joke. Indiana Jones, as it stands, is far from politically correct. Anyways, later that evening, Indy has his moment with Willy, where they sweet talk each other with flirtatious dialogue. I guess by this point, Willie is starting to like Indy, especially when he provides her with normal food after the disaster at the banquet. I don't have much to say here. Immediately after though, an assassin arises in Indy's room who tries to strangle him to death. But knowing the last movie in this one, who isn't trying to kill Indy? Of course, after a good struggle, which is completely organic feeling, Indy with the help of Short Round, counter strangle the thug who gets caught on a fan and ooh, he's dead. Indy trying to figure out where the assassin came from, in which he finds a secret door when looking around Willie's room. I like to mention that it's over 50 minutes, and we're now at the Temple of Doom part, title wise. Still though, the build up has been sufficient and well crafted. The adventure has been so fast and entertaining that recalling how the movie started is amazing. They were in China for something unrelated, and now they're in a palace in India. Man has a lot happened already, and we're almost at the halfway point already. Still though, the story isn't convoluted at all. Anyways, Indy and Short Round go into the depths of the Temple of Doom, 
Willie is reluctant to follow after them, but after some hesitation, she opts to follow after them. By this point, Indy and Short Round have stumbled into a spike trap, and Willie has to save both of them, albeit with Indy's instructions. The problem to Willie is that she's supposed to pull a lever surrounded by more creepy crawlies, and watching it, yep, that's nasty. So after narrowly avoiding another damn trap, Indy and friends proceed to the area of one of the most memorable scenes in the whole movie. The proper introduction of the Kali worshipping thuggy cult, and to the film's main villain. They really built quite the set here, and the scene visually uses the colour red and yellow to signify that some intense shit is going down. Like for real. This is bound to be exactly what people think of when they think of a cult doing cult stuff. When asked by Willie, Indy explains that nobody's seen something like this for a hundred years. Yeah, as if they couldn't build up hype enough. Now I mentioned the main villain being seen around here, and that's correct. Around an hour and one minute into the film, we see the leader of the cult, Mola Ram played by the late Amrish Puri. And damn does this guy mean business. I also like the symbolism of him wearing a cow skull for a hat which is pretty much desecrating how India values cows. Immediately after, the thuggy cult pulls out a helpless man and strap him into a cage. And Molaram moves in a slow and sinister way, says something in Hindi I presume, and then pulls his hand towards the victim's chest. And in case you haven't seen the movie, he straight up digs into his chest and rips out his heart for all to see. In the most gruesome detail ever, Indy notes how the victim is still alive somehow. Then, if you thought they couldn't top that, we're now going to get into the human sacrifice. The cage is lowered, with excited chants by the cultists, as the helpless man is lowered into a pit of lava and fire. And yeah, he's burnt alive, with Mola Ram sadistically laughing, holding a burning heart as it melts away. The presentation is gold as the intense music and cuts make this scene jaw-dropping. It is all played for shock value, but it isn't cheap in the slightest. It's all genuine shock created from such a disturbing and memorable scene. The ritual ends with the helpless man sacrificed to Kali. Indy could do nothing but watch. He couldn't save this man. It's also here where Indy witnesses the stolen Sankara stones, as they're placed in front of a giant skull. After the ritual is over, everyone leaves, and Indy decides to take a big risk, intending to take all three of the stones, because let's face it, the thuggy cultists definitely do not deserve it. He goes further into the Temple of Doom to investigate, but Willie and Short Round are captured by the cultists. Indy discovers the cult's mind that demonstrates another horrible crime child slavery. As the mine is worked by nothing but children in harsh conditions, the head slaver of the mines, played by Pat Roach, who was also the German mechanic in Raiders, returns for the sequel, or prequel, whatever. As a brutal overseer with a whip who constantly whips the slaves if they don't work hard enough, or slip up. Since he's playing a dude from India, he's in brown face, which might be racist, but then I realized I wanted Pat Roach to return for another fight with Indy, and it wouldn't make much sense to make him white. Besides, the brown face isn't used to make a racist statement about Indians. Well, anyways, it's here where Indy is pretty disgusted, and throws a rock at the overseer. I have to question why he alerted the cult to his presence, but I guess he was going to get caught eventually anyways. Still though, it is a case of poor writing. Anyways, once Indy is captured, he's chained up, and one of the kids in the cell with him talks about how he prayed to die, but Shiva won't let him, and now he'll be subject to the black sleep of Kali. As described, it's basically some black magic that'll turn you into an evil cult worshipper. We cut to a scene sometime later with Indy and Mola Ram's first interaction. Mola Ram drops some backstory for the stones, saying that there were five in the beginning, but due to the span of time, they were separated. That's why they're practicing child slavery, to force the poor kids to dig for the stones. Then of course, they bring out the substance, and force Indy to drink it. With much struggle of course, and Short Round trying the best he can to get him to reject the liquid, but it is eventually forced down his throat as the Maharaja, also with the cult, 
brings out a voodoo doll to torture Indy. Short Round is forced away to work in the mines like the other kids, and Indy is forced to drink the liquid. Molaram also has an evil monologue where he intends to impose their twisted religion as the only in the world. So in case you think this cult's only gonna exist in India, think again. They're gonna force everyone else to bow down to them. High stakes supreme now. We get a scene of Indy succumbing to the black sleep of Kali, and after so much struggling, he wakes up reborn, with a twisted and sinister smile. I can only imagine the audience reaction being like, oh no, he's one of them now. The lighting too really sells the scene. This is pretty much the low point of the movie, where everything that could go wrong has. And in the very next scene, we get Willie Scott being prepped for sacrifice to Kali. Indy, now possessed by the dark magic, speaks for the cult. And you can tell that he's a completely different person in this scene. He is visibly possessed by the magic, and accompanying him is the Prime Minister. Willie is brought out, panicking as usual, although understandable in this instance. When Willie is strapped into the cage, there's a bit of variation. Molaram does not in fact rip her heart out but calls for Indy to come over. Willie tries to reason with the possessed Indy, but he just brushes her off, and the ritual is about to begin. In the meanwhile, Short Round who was sent to the mines disobeys the slavers, and uses his mining tool to instead break his chains. Looking out, and working at it for a few minutes, he eventually breaks them and takes the opportunity to escape. Hiding when appropriate, he climbs up a ladder, and then uses the ladder to do a crazy maneuver to get to the ritual fast enough. By the time he gets there, Willie's already been lowered down, and Short Round comes into the ritual trying to get Indy to wake up. The possessed Indy slaps him away, and this brings Short Round to tears. And yeah, I feel ya buddy. Short Round proclaims how he loves Indy as a father figure, and grabs a torch and partially burns Indy with it. This here, is the solution. As Indy wakes up from the inflicted curse, and now regaining his conscious, he pretends to grab Short Round, and winks at him that he's alright, and the two of them kick the cultist's asses. And yeah, this is deliberately set up for a reaction of relief. Indy, now a hero again, beats the shit out of the thuggy cultist, and even throws one of them off to his death. Although Molaram escapes through a trap door, Indy proceeds to raise Willy up, and despite an ambush by the Prime Minister, he is overpowered and Indy and Short Round save Willy. As such, Short Round hands Indy his equipment, and we get this little moment where Indy puts Short Round's cap on him, affirming that he is like a son to him. So yeah, Indy grabs the Sankara stones with his bag, as well as a shirt, and his whip and so on. And now, it's time to punish the cult for their heinous deeds. Willy begs Indy to get out of here, and Indy responds, Right. All of us. Yeah, that's right. No child left behind except it's better than the George W. Bush policy. Indy shows up in the mines in a dramatic fashion to beat the shit out of the captors, and proceeds to free all the children. Some have criticized this whole sequence for being part of the white savior trope, which is exactly what it sounds like. And while that may be true, I don't think it's done in a derogatory way. Indy saving these children, and no comment is made that they're Indian. Eventually, the overseer comes out, and not appreciating that he freed all the children, we get a fight similar to the one with the German mechanic. It's the same actors after all. Anyways, the overseer beats the shit out of Indy, throwing him onto a cart, and intending to crush him under a roller. Adding to the problem is the Maharaja, who is actively using the voodoo doll to harm Indy, such as giving him incredible back pain, among other things. Short Round and Willie see the Maharaja, and Short Round climbs all the way up to him, and fights him to get him off Indy. Eventually, there's a point where the Overseer has the upper hand, and has Indy at his mercy. Short Round manages to get the spike out of Indy's voodoo doll, and Indy manages to get the upper hand on the Overseer, and beats the shit out of him for all the crap he put him through. The Overseer's clothes get caught on the crushing roller, and yep, He's dead. At the same time, Short Round takes the Maharaja out of the black sleep of Kali using the same flame trick. 
the Maharaja tells Short Round afterwards to use the left tunnel to escape. Getting into a minecart, Willie and Short Round cry on for Indy to get onto their cart to escape. And Indy uses his whip to get over to them while the thuggy cultists are firing shots at him. Although as for the left tunnel escape, well the tracks are changed to the right tunnel. And here we get one of the most impressive set pieces in this film, the minecart chase. This was apparently originally a set piece for Raiders that was scrapped, but Lucas and Spielberg knew for a fact that they would use it for the next movie. This minecart chase is well edited, and the special effects are really good. ILM did a really good job. Throughout this chase, Indian friends take out the thuggy cultists chasing after them, and Willie actually has a useful contribution by punching one of the cultists off to save Indy. However, Molaram gets his remaining goons to cause a flood in the mines, in the hopes that it will kill Indian friends. After reaching the end of the mines, Indian friends get out of the cart, and narrowly avoid the flood. Willie and Short Round make their way up to a high up bridge. Willie is reluctant to go across, but eventually they go to the other side. It's also where we see a whole load of crocodiles that greet you if you fall. We get a call back to the instant gunshot scene, except now since Indy's lacking a gun, he just beats the crap out of the two cultist swordsmen. Although it's a different story when a whole legion of them chase him, and he's forced to run. Although he doesn't make it very far, and neither does Short Round and Willie. Mola rams on the other side, and now Indian friends are cornered by thuggy cultists on both sides, and this is where the climax kicks in. Both sides prepare to approach Indy, with Willie and Short Round as hostages. Indy threatens to drop the stones if they aren't released, but Mola Ram doesn't care if he drops them, proclaiming that they'll simply be found again. So what does Indy do? Yeah, you know what he's going to do. He speaks the short round in Chinese to grab onto the bridge, and he informs Willie to do the same. Before he does the deed, he spouts out one of the most awesome one-liners I've ever heard. Around, prepare to meet Kali in hell. So he cuts the bridge, and causes it to fall down. Molaram only has barely enough time to grab on before the bridge is split in two. Here, it's a struggle to throw each other off. Mola Ram actually commits the villain kills his own men cliche by throwing one of his own men off in an attempt to get Indy to lose grip. He gleefully laughs at his goon's demise, even when Indy manages to dodge it. Yeah, that's another case of bad writing. Unless... You know what, I'm gonna talk about something soon, just bear with me. During the struggle, Mola Ram tries to rip Indy's heart, although he manages to get his grip off. Molaram tries to get the bag off Indy, and during all this, the three stones boil up, with two of them falling out into the river, with the third being grabbed by Molaram, in which it burns in his hand, and he loses grip and falls to his death, with Indy grabbing the last stone fortunately. Now, I think something interesting to talk about is the black sleep of Kali, and who it applies to. I wanted to talk about this at the very end. Although Indy was possessed by the dark magic, and the Maharaja was influenced too, it's reason to ask who else was affected. Was the Overseer actually under the influence? What about the Prime Minister? Or what about Molaram himself? When it occurred to me that any character in the cult could be under the influence of the Black Sleep, it made me think about the movie very differently. I don't know if any other critic has brought it up, but it's a very valid question. In fact, in earlier treatments of the script, upon touching the Sankara Stone, Molaram would be briefly revealed to be under the influence of the Black Sleep before falling to his death. This was cut from the final film, because it would not make for a satisfying death. Rather, a tragic one, as well as having Indy realize he killed an innocent man. However, it's not confirmed whether or not Molaram was actually innocent in the final film. Hence this debate. The original plan for Molaram's death is even featured in the novelization, so I hear. In the film, we're not supposed to think about whether anyone Indy beat the shit out of was actually under the influence of the Black Sleep or not. But once the question is asked, it's not easy to put it down. I think for Molaram in particular, we probably should have gotten a scene beforehand where they confirm without a shadow of a doubt that he is not under the influence of the Black Sleep. I think canonically, based on the changes to the script, Molaram was acting of his own accord. But since it's not confirmed, it's uncertain. And I imagine Indy himself might have pondered on this possibility after the fact. We don't get much information on Molaram's backstory, so this question is left inconclusive. I just wanted to bring this up, 
as it really bugged me when I started to realize it. And the film's solution is to simply not think about it. However, with all that being said, Indy manages to climb his way up, with the British Indian forces showing up to take out the cultists, and they're stopped as a threat. Indy and friends make it all the way back to the village, with Indy heralded as a hero, with him returning the stones to the village, and the movie pretty much wraps up there, with everyone happy. And that was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Perhaps this was a much different movie than Raiders, but it's still great. Spicing things up didn't hurt anyone. It's believable as being an earlier Indiana Jones adventure focusing on a different culture. And the film's imagination and set pieces are extremely creative. You can clearly tell this film was a reflection of George Lucas having a hard time with his divorce. But despite all that, it worked to the movie's favour. As the shock value is effective. And Indy wasn't supposed to be seen by young children in the first place. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is an effective standalone prequel that shows us more of Indy, as well as recycling many of the motifs of the first film. This is recognisable as an Indy movie, more than just the returning protagonist, but it still has different locations, characters and villains. Short Round in the Dark content were especially a highlight, and as such, I award Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom a 9.5 out of 10, slightly lower than Raiders, but still, it very much holds its own. Next up, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. May we celebrate the final days before Dial of Destiny comes out and ruins everything. I'm Ginger Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories but mystery boxes? Under the mountain.